As we move into chapter three, this chapter is really, in my opinion, separated into two distinct parts that we need to cover. Therefore, I'm going to separate the recording into two, two different recordings. I think that'll make it easier for you to spend time listening and making sure that you're comfortable with the material. So part one that we're really going to focus on in chapter three is really learning um, the structure and what these amino acids look like on their own. Now, as we move on into chapter four, we're going to start calling these amino acid residues because we're going to look at the amino acids as they're combined to form peptides and proteins. So a dehydration reaction has occurred and water has been removed. So they're then going to be residues. But for now, we're going to call them amino acids. And as you can see, dreaded in between these little stars, yes, it is important for you to make sure you can draw the individual amino acids. Drawing the amino acids really makes sure that you understand the overall structure and how those structural characteristics can give you the properties for the individual amino acids. The structure of these amino acids, especially the R group, is what really drives the structure and property of the peptide. One thing we'll learn with these amino acids is depending on the pH level, we can change the characteristics of the amino acids. And that's because they are exactly as their name suggests. They are acids. They have pKa's, so they can serve as buffers. We're going to look at the ionization of these amino acids. So we're going to continue looking at titration curves, really reinforcing that topic. Now, the second recording I'll make for you guys will be what I consider part two of this chapter, and that is looking at some of the different methods we use to characterize peptides and proteins. This may seem a little different than the first part of the chapter, but what you need to understand is what we've learned in this chapter about the characteristics of the amino acids is what allows us to do these different characterization methods. So it is very related. So why do proteins matter? Why are we spending time studying these amino acids? We need to study amino acids so we can build our proteins. Proteins are responsible for catalysis, transport, structure, movement or motion, so many things inside of the human body. And if you can't tell from the um, expression in my voice, I'm not looking at you right now, but proteins are really my favorite part of biochemistry. So I really like to highlight their importance to you. So let's move on into these amino acid structures and make sure we can get an understanding of the basic structure. So our alpha amino acids, and we term them alpha amino acids because we get this naming from um, basically the way sugars are named. So we take a Fisher projection or a ball and stick method, e either way we do this and we take, we put the most oxidized carbon at the top and then we put all of our carbon chains in a line. And so the carbon right next to our most oxidized carbon, that's what we call our alpha carbon. So all amino acids have this alpha carbon with four substituents sticking out. Since most of our amino acids have four different things, from the alpha carbon for different things bonded to that alpha carbon, they are going to be chiral. Now there is an exception. Glycine, our simplest amino acid, has an R group that is hydrogen. So that's the only one that's not chiral. All amino acids are going to have the alpha carbon, a hydrogen, a carboxylic acid, so we have an acidic group, and an amino group, so we have a basic group. And then we'll have this fourth, fourth substituent that is going to be different. And that's really what makes us have the 20 common amino acids are these different R groups. Further naming of our amino acid, we're going to follow down from the alpha carbon and we'll have beta, gamma, and so on and so forth as we continue. Again, starting with alpha carbon being the carbon closest to the most oxidized carbon, our carboxylic acid carbon. So in this picture, we see lysine. And so this nomenclature is important because when we get to some of our more complex amino acids, like lysine, we have more than one amino group. 
So we would designate these as the epsilon amino group or the alpha amine group. So it's important to just recognize this is the proper way that we name our amino acids. So just looking at this a little closer, as we said in the earlier slide, amino acids are going to be chiral with the exception of the R group um, on glycine. It's just a hydrogen, so it's not chiral. The proteins um, in nature are only going to contain L amino acids. So you can remember this however you would like. The way I was taught this by my biochemistry instructor is looking at this in the Fisher projection setup where the carboxylic acid is at the top. L amino acids are going to have the amine on the left. And so if I'm looking at my screen right now, my left hand is on the same side as my amine group. That's an L amino acid. So this is going to be our simplest chiral amino acid alanine that we can look at to really get an understanding for that. Now experimentally, if you start making amino acids, you get a nice little mixture of L and D amino acids. Um, but in nature, they're going to exist as majority L amino acids. And this comes from enzyme specificity to produce these amino acids, as well as enzyme specificity of how we're going to interact these amino acids with other molecules. So the chirality is very important. So now moving on, let's look at how these amino acids are classified. Commonly, we are going to put these amino acids into five basic groups. And here's your five groups that the Leninger text uses. The nonpolar aliphatic, the aromatic, polar uncharged, so capable of hydrogen bonding but have no charge, positively charged, and negatively charged. Now, if we look at a protein in nature, we're going to see more than these 20 basic amino acids. But these 20 amino acids form the basis for all the other amino acids that we might see incorporated into proteins. These other amino acids that we see will come from post-translational modifications, and we're going to discuss those a little later as we go along. So let's take a look at these 20 most common amino acids that you are going to learn how to draw and become comfortable with. The first group is our largest group. This is what we consider the hydrophobic or nonpolar aliphatic amino acids. So first off, let's make sure we understand we're looking at in the center here of every one of these is the alpha carbon, always attached to a carboxylic acid, an amine group, and a hydrogen. What's shown in this kind of orangey shaded area, that is representative of the R group that gives us the different amino acid we're looking at. So the most simple of the amino acids, it's not chiral, is glycine. Then we move to alanine with a methyl group in the R group. The next on this list is proline. Proline is a unique amino acid. It forms this um, five-member ring structure. It is, this is a very stable structure, so you'll see this in a lot of places where we need a lot of stability in our protein. Also, you'll see proline in a lot of places where we need a, a different angle because it's such a different amino acid. With valine, I always could remember that valine almost looks like a V when we look at the R group shape. Then leucine and isoleucine, they're the branched ones. Isoleucine is kind of interesting because it actually has two chiral carbons. And we're not going to go into too much detail on that, but it is one of the few that has the um, the other chiral carbon and then methionine does as well. Methionine has this sulfur here, so the thioester, um, this group, but it's not capable of hydrogen bonding or forming disulfide bonds. So our next group are our aromatic R groups. Now these are what we would consider relatively hydrophobic, and I say relatively hydrophobic because tyrosine and tryptophan does have an area that is capable of hydrogen bonding. What's interesting about these um, aromatic amino acids is that they have a side chain capable of absorbing ultraviolet light. This is going to be used when we're trying to detect protein in our um, experimental studies that we're going to go into a little bit more at the end of the chapter. Phenylalanine is the simplest of the aromatics with 
the one methyl group and then the aromatic ring. Tyrosine is phenylalanine plus a hydroxyl group. And then tryptophan is a really large amino acid. Now it is capable of forming some hydrogen bonding, but it's such a large hydrophobic region that this almost acts as an amphipathic molecule when we see it incorporated into proteins. Our next group, we're getting a little bit more reactive. These are uh, polar uncharged. This is what I would consider the more hydrophilic, or as I like to say, they can hydrogen bond fairly easily. So I've used these red rings to circle the area that is capable of hydrogen bonding. Now the cysteine sulfhydryl group here is not as good of a um, hydrogen bonding agent as the others, but it can form disulfide bonds, which are incredibly important when we start thinking of overall um, stabilization and protein structure. Our most hydrophilic, can readily hydrogen bond, are going to be our positive and negatively charged R groups. So first here are the positively charged R groups. And we, we put them in this category because they have a R group PKA, so we have an extra ionizable group here on the side chain. And these are all going to have an amine. The amine in lysine and arginine is positively charged when we're in neutral pH, which is the main pH we're interested in the human body. Now histidine's a little bit different. The pKa of its R group amine is near 7. It's actually around 6. So at a pH of 7, we're going to see this as a not charge most of the time. It's going to depend on what's around the histidine within the protein. So we'll see this a lot of times present um, working in an acid-base reaction inside of enzymatic um, catalytic sites. So histidine is very interesting amino acid. Then our last group here we have aspartate and glutamate, also called aspartic acid and glutamic acid. These are our negatively charged R groups. Both of these are going to have a negatively charged carboxylic acid at neutral pH where the protons have been lost. So your first step is to make sure you can draw and play around with those amino acids. Now we need to think about what can the, what's the chemistry of the amino acids and what can we learn from this. And so the easiest way to see the chemistry is to look at a titration curve and understand the ionization of the amino acids. Okay? So looking at this titration curve, we see two inflection points with these two blue rectangles. The two inflection points tell us there's two ionizable groups in this example. Now in this example we're using glycine. Because it's the simplest of the amino acids, there's no ionizable R group. So when we notice the first pKa is going to always be around 2, that's the pKa for this carboxylic acid group shown here. So below the pKa1, we're going to have protons present on all of our ionizable side groups. So the overall charge here is going to be plus 1. When we get to the pK1 of 2.34, we see we've lost half of the protons on this carboxylic acid group. And then we continue going up, we start losing the rest of those carboxylic acid protons. Then we begin to approach the second pK. This is the pKa for the amine group shown here. So as we get above this pKa, above 9.6, we've lost all the protons on this amine group here. So anywhere up here, we're going to see a negatively charged amino acid. Anywhere in the center, we're going to see some negatively charged, some positively charged, and some neutral. At the point in the curve here, we see the isoelectric point. The isoelectric point is going to be the area where we have a completely neutral amino acid. It means all of the carboxylic acids have lost their protons, so they're all negatively charged. But all of the amine groups are still protonated, so they're all positively charged. This is the area where we have the Zwitter ion. Completely
completely neutral amino acid. One way that you can study and really work with this to make sure you're understanding is pick you a place on this curve, think about the pH, and see if you can draw the predominant form of the amino acid. So let's take this spot here where the cursor sits. We're at a pH of around three, maybe go a little higher, three and a half, somewhere right here. So at a pK, a pH of three and a half, we are above the pKa of the carboxylic acid. So at a pH of 3, the carboxylic acid is going to be negatively charged. Since we are well below pK2, the amine group will still be positively charged. So overall, we're going to see mainly zwitter ion in this area. So I highly recommend that you can See if you can come up with the predominant species just to make sure you can play around with adding and removing these protons. Mathematically, you can calculate the PI without seeing the titration curve simply by adding the two pKs together and dividing by two. Also, I added this to the slides because I had a few students that seemed to struggle with this some last year. It's important for you to just keep it straight in your mind that if you're below the PI, your net charge is going to be positive. If you're above the PI, then your net charge is typically going to be negative. That's kind of the norm that we're looking at. So can this get a little bit more complicated? Well, it can when we start adding those extra ionizable groups. And the example here from your textbook is histidine. So when we take a look at histidine, we have the pK1. This is going to be the pK of the carboxylic acid attached to the alpha carbon. And we have pK2. This is going to be the pK of the amine group attached to your alpha carbon. Histidine has an additional amine group in the R. So that's going to be representative here by your pKr. So when you have these ionizable side groups, you actually have three pKa's. You get an extra buffering region, makes it a little bit more complex of an amino acid, but it's more useful for you. So if we take a look at this, so in this region below the first pKa, the overall charge is actually going to be plus two. Okay. So below here, all of your amines and your carboxylic acid are protonated. We start moving up the titration curve. As we go above the pK of the carboxylic acid, it begins to lose protons, lose protons. So the carboxylic acid is becoming more and more negative. As we approach this inflection point, now all of our carboxylic acids are going to be negatively charged. And we have two positively charged amine groups, so overall charge is plus one. Then we start approaching the pKr. So we'll slowly begin losing protons from this amine group in our R group. As we approach the pI, we're then going to have our zwitter ion form completely neutral. Then we'll begin to ultimately lose all of those R group protons. Now overall charge is zero. Continue moving as we approach the pK2 of the pKa of the alpha carbon amine group. We'll slowly begin to lose the proton from this amine group until we get to a high enough pH that our overall charge is going to be negative one. So how do you calculate the pI when you have an ionizable R group? Well, if this is the proper way to think of it, you need to identify the pKa that defines the acid stream and then the pKa that defines the base stream, taking the average of the two. Well, that's a lot more complicated than my easier way. If your R group's carboxylic acid, you use the two low pKa's. If your R group has an amine, you use the two high pKa's to calculate your pI. So if you go back here to the histidine, you see the R group has an amine, right? 
So to get your PI, you use the two higher PKAs. PI is going to be around 7.59. Now that we are beginning to learn what these amino acids look like, we can now move into the actual reaction that forms a peptide. So this is going to be the formation of our peptide bond. To create a peptide bond, you take the two amine amino acids, water is removed, so the OH is removed from a carboxylic acid, and a proton is moved from an amine from the second amino acid, water's removed, and you form this peptide bond. Now in the next chapter, we're going to take a look at the overall angle of the peptide bond, how flexible the peptide bond is, and things of that nature. But for now, we just want to understand this is a dehydration reaction forming a very stable bond. Once we form a peptide, we put several amino acids together, we can see we will have a charged or potentially charged amino terminal in where the one free amine group is going to be. And then we'll have the one potentially charged carboxylic acid group at the end. But all of our other ionizable groups are part of this peptide bond right here. Okay. So what we begin to see is the actual characteristics of the peptide are going to come from these R groups. You need to be comfortable naming peptides. I'm going to do it mainly like this using the three letter code. Now, as you continue in your studies in biochemistry, you'll probably be forced to use the single letter code. Um, but for now, and just with constructs of time, we're really going to focus just more on remembering these um, three letter codes. Now, before we move into part two, I want to show you what you should focus on now. I need you guys to open up your chapter three practice problems, and you will see how I want you to practice. I want you to draw these different amino acids, drawing the most predominant species you would see at the different pHs. Calculate your PIs, and then I want you to draw this peptide out at pH 7. We're now going to move into another audio I'll record and then we'll be able to answer how you would purify this. So at this point you have the information you need to do all of your practice problems through number 4.